Good morning. Good morning. And welcome on the web. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. And He's good even when it's raining, because we need this rain for something, don't we? Farmers are saying, No, we don't. I'm going to read from Ecclesiastes this morning. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. And I think that's, that's probably a good thing for us. If we could see the whole scope from beginning to end, I don't think we could handle that. So uh, it's probably a good thing that God does things in his time and not our time. And we get to see the blessings of that later down the road when we thought we wanted this to happen at this time. But then later we see it happen and we're like, oh, yeah, he is good because he kept me from that there, brought it to me at this time, right when I needed it. So it's just amazing how he does that. So let, let's greet each other with love. All right, now we're going to do things in the right order. We can have a seat. My problem with doing both services is I get confused and I do some of second service and first service and vice versa in the other service. So that's what we usually do in second service. We go directly into greeting after I read. So we're going to start now with announcements. Do we have any announcements? I do know that we have Attaboy, which is a uh, band that is um, it's doing missionaries in public schools. And I know that we had the privilege of going to Warsaw High School and see them in concert when they came. And um, the girls got to go with us. Uh, it was actually the first day that Justina showed up at our home and she was like completely overwhelmed. But being able, that was in God's time, being able to take her to that uh, event and help ease her into the transition was amazing because their their message that they give is is basically just to lift you up it's just amazing so it is awesome that they're coming to our uh, on Sunday September 23rd here and uh, um, yeah I, I, I just wanted to mention that Attaboy is a, a real good uh, mission for uh, getting the young kids and just remember that we are having a combined service on September 30th, and we're going to have a lunch. Uh, the meat is going to be provided. If you just bring in a carry-in, that would be good. Any other announcements? If not... Right, I wanted to piggyback just a, a little... Whoa, hi! <laughs> Uh, I wanted to piggyback on the Attaboy just a little bit in case there are questions. Yes, they are a, a band. Yes, they come and minister into our schools. They are not coming here Sunday morning for a concert. Um, they're coming to preach and to share their ministry. 
And uh, I would call it an extended mission moment. Uh, and uh, to catch a vision, uh, Rhonda has been working with them and uh, would like to partner more with our youth in, in their ministry. And so uh, I just wanted to give you a word of encouragement. Uh, please don't stay away thinking you're going to get involved in a rock concert uh, on that morning. Uh, it truly is a, uh, uh, an opportunity to catch a vision of what's happening in our high schools and with our youth and to be uh, mindful of how to pray for, how to support, and how to reach uh, uh, these young people who desperately need Jesus. So uh, I want you to come out and I hope be inspired that morning through, their, uh, through the preaching of the word and their testimony of their ministry. Yeah. And now if you'd rise and we'll sing the hymn 548, but she's going to be playing the music on 549. Now we come to a time of, of joys and prayer concerns. Do we have any joys and prayer concerns? That you, is it on? I ask that you continue to keep Judy in prayer. She does have a date for her surgery will be October the 1st. And also keep Ed in prayer because he's not feeling real well this morning. Yeah, just uh, our son David got back from Spain a couple weeks ago. He was gone for with the Navy for six months, so praise that he's back home safely. And two days after, or three days after he got back, they had another hurricane that came up there. It wasn't a very big one this time, so so they're safe from that. And I'm doing quite well. The last three weeks have been very good for me. I haven't had the tiredness or the weakness or shorter breath that I've been having, so maybe I'm past that. Well, since we are new to um, Walnut Creek, um, I don't know if this is a joy or a concern, <laughs> but in the new directory, uh, I am now married to David Strain instead of Denny Strain. <laughs> so you might want to make a correction in your book because it's Denny, not David. <laughs> All right. Any other joys or prayer concerns? I, uh, I know that Catherine, uh, we're calling her Katie, she's asked us to call her Katie. She's got a... Uh, younger, I think it's a nephew, that his name's Silas, and he's really young, um, and he's needing some prayers. He's having a hard time breathing, 
and uh, she wanted me to ask for prayers for, for Silas. Are there any others? If not, I'll turn over to Pastor Gray. I did receive a phone call last evening from Larry Landis uh, sharing the passing of his mother. So uh, please uh, uh, lift their family up. No arrangements uh, have been finalized yet. But uh, remember Larry Landis' family. Um, as we uh, come and share uh, in collective prayer, uh, one of the things we often think about in collective prayer is somebody needs to be speaking uh, so that uh, we participate through the hearing of, of someone else's sharing and, and prayer. I remember as a very young child, um, Arthur and Bertha sat right up here uh, in the uh, front pew of, of our church. And um, I sat usually way back there in the back uh, where I could lay down on that back pew and run my little cars. Uh, I remember that vividly. And I also remembered whenever the pastor called on Arthur to pray, I would have a big gasp. Oh my goodness. Because when Arthur prayed, uh, it was measured in not minutes, but uh, tens of minutes. Uh, and he was very long-winded. And I remember uh, what an awesome man and a, a powerful prayer, but I dreaded that time uh, because it was in a sense, non-participatory on, on my part for such a, a long period of time. Probably being four or five years old didn't help either. Um, I, when we pray this morning, um, I wanted to uh, pray in a, in a little different way that's also uncomfortable. Sometimes the lengthy prayers are uncomfortable. Uh, when we're sitting, waiting, um, sometimes silence can be uncomfortable. Um, and yet, uh, that is an appropriate way to pray. Uh, prayer is conversational. Prayer is the sharing of what's on our heart, but it's also the listening as to what is on God's heart in Isaiah uh, the 41st chapter and 11th verse God says listen in silence before me um, there's many things that encourage us to listen to pause, to wait. Jesus modeled that and demonstrated it as he went away uh, in silence to be before God the Father. And so we're going to take some moments today. Um, uh, I'm gonna actually time and go about a minute and a half of, of silence. You might get uncomfortable. Your mind may wander to somewhere else other than prayer. You may struggle in that focus. But let's stop. Let's be silent before our God and let him speak in the midst of our worship. Would you quietly pray with me.
as we have prayed through the silence of listening, of waiting on you, O oh God. We now collectively lift our voices as we make our requests, our worship, our praise known unto you, O oh God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our scripture reading today comes from Luke 15, 11 through 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he had divided his property between them. Not long after that, the young son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But an aunt but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave, even, gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now is the time for offering. Um, just uh, give as your heart is led.
your heavenly Father, we just thank you for everything that you, in, you, you entitle to us, Lord. You give us, Lord, that you trust us with, Lord. And, Lord, we just give back to you so that we can um, just honor in your glory, Lord. Uh, just bless this giving and help it to do uh, the work that you have set out for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have a habit, a, a, a bad habit, I suppose, of losing things. Ink pens, keys, papers, books, phones, uh, vehicles, <laughs> houses, especially we lived and when we lived in an inner city area, and I, at times, would, yes, pull up to the wrong house. Um, uh, I've lost kids, and repeatedly, I lose Carol, especially in those big box stores. I don't know how she does it, but um, I can't find her. The pattern in my life is pretty consistent. I misplace something of value to me. I spend minutes, days, or hours, sometimes weeks, looking for said item. And the object is found or returned eventually, and inwardly I celebrate. That's such a good feeling when something that was lost is found. My celebration is often tempered. My happy dance is not overt. Rarely do I lift my hands or shout for joy. It's an inner kind of celebration of saying sometimes, thank you, Lord. Sometimes, hallelujah. Sometimes, just a quiet, peaceful sense of knowing 
that which was lost is now found. No big doings. No overt, expensive recognition. That seems a little too extravagant for me. A little distasteful. I want to keep decorum, even though I'm thrilled that after pulling into three different driveways, I finally have gotten to my right house. I want to get out and shout, Yahoo! But that just wouldn't be proper. Inwardly, I say thank you. Finances is something we keep pretty personal, isn't it? We really don't want people to, to, to know our business. And we often say it's nobody's business. In fact, I'm a little uncomfortable listening to a Peace Financial University uh, podcast with Dave Ramsey who invites those families who have finally gotten out of debt to give a cheer, a loud cheer. And he doesn't want to turn down the microphone either. In fact, they spend usually four or five minutes chronicling the journey of, of getting debt free. And then the couple together will usually shout out, and sometimes their kids included, Yahoo! We are debt free! Unashamed, excited. That which they had lost, their financial peace, their security, has now been found. And it's cause for celebration. beginning of the 15th chapter of Luke. It begins with the commentary. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Certainly no celebration on their part was there. In fact, the scripture is clear. It was a muttering. They could see no potential of lost being found. They saw no value coming forth uh, of Jesus meeting with those sinners of sitting down and eating with them, of welcoming them into his presence. The parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and what I would call the two lost sons begins with tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, teachers of the law with no cause at this point for celebration. Only some muttering under the teachers of the law breath. Jesus used parables, those earthly stories with eternal significance, those earthly stories with heavenly meanings. He told these stories to help usually the religious to see something in a new light. Lostness. 
the lost coin. Lost for no reason of the coin's part in it. The lost sheep. No reason of malice on the sheep's part. Just a bit of a, of, of a scatterbrained, unintentional wandering that moved the sheep into that status. When Jesus got to the third parable, he brought it close to home. We aren't talking about sheep and coins any longer. He, he, he said that a man had two sons. Immediately, everybody around him, his Jewish audience, was thinking of the Old Testament storylines. Oh, you know, those Old Testament families of, of two sons, of Adam, the father, with the two sons, Cain and Abel, of Abraham, the father, and his two sons, Ishmael and Israel. You know, of, of Isaac, the father, and his two twin sons, Esau being just a little bit older, Jacob, the younger. And when, when his listeners heard this parable, he, they heard again the stories playing in their mind. A man had two sons. Oh, here we go again. We've heard that before. We know how this turns out. The older son does some evil, stupid things. The younger son turns out to be clever and responsible, ultimately righteous. And the younger son becomes the successor to the promise. All ends well and happy. Jesus startles them for in this story, it's the younger son who is reckless. It's the younger son who is the prodigal. It's the younger son who is overtly rebelling against the father's desires, who is wasteful. His hearers were hearing this surprise. What about Abel? What about Israel? What about Jacob? Those younger, God-fearing sons who God gave the promise to. Uh, how does this all turn out for a reckless, prodigal son never returns home. He's squandered his father's wealth. He's giving himself over to the Gentile community. He's even feeding the pigs and desiring that for him. In their minds, they were trying to put this story together. The father waiting, anticipating, looking, desiring, yearning for the return of his prodigal son, the older son, faithfully serving his father while the prodigal goes and squanders the family wealth. The father waits, longingly looking for that opportunity 
writer to the Hebrews says that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. This loving father believed that. Deep in his heart, he never gave up. Deep in his heart, he yearned that God would do something good. That there would be an outcome to this lost son that would be worth celebrating. That would be happy. That it would have a good ending in some way. So when the father looked out and saw the younger son coming from a distance... And we know that he was looking, anticipating, longing because he made plans and preparations when he saw that son from afar. The son, on his part, came to a point of desperation. The younger son came to a point and a place where he realized that his life was bankrupt not only financially, but spiritually. And he rehearsed in his own mind exactly what he would do. For he observed that his life was a mess, and even the slaves, the servants of his father's house, had life better than what he did. And so in his mind, he prepared as he was heading back home to tell his father that he has sinned, that he longs to be treated as one of the father's servants that he was ready to be a part of the family again. The younger son didn't get out all that he had rehearsed until the father already excited and thrilled to see his son coming He ran to meet him. He threw his arms around him before he could get out his entire speech. And he kissed him, welcomed him him back into the family. The father said to his servants, quick, Put the best robe on my son. Treat him like royalty. Put a ring on his finger, a sign of his authority and being back into our family and home. And put sandals on his feet because he's not just a servant, but he is my son. And I am celebrating this. Bring the fattened calf. Let's have a feast and celebrate just like the sheep owner finding the one lost sheep let's party let's celebrate let's rejoice in the finding of this sheep like the woman who turned out her her entire home when she lost one of her coins and when she found it had a huge celebration of joy and thanksgiving The one thing that is common in all three of the parables is when the lost has been found, it is cause for celebration. Woohoo! Yahoo! A, a lost one has been found. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. By all accounts, we believe this was a good son. By all accounts, we believe this was a faithful son. By all accounts, the people of the community would have seen this older son as the rightful inheritor of the father's wealth. He had been working out in the field all day, which was his 
custom and habit undoubtedly and he heard music and dancing and he called one of the servants and he asked him what's going on and he said to him your brother has come home and your father's killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound Woo-hoo! let's party yes isn't this wonderful your brother that prodigal brother of yours has returned That is cause for joy, thanksgiving, and celebration. The older brother became angry. He refused to go into the party. So the father, like he had done for his younger son, he went to the older son and He opened up, he greeted the older son, and he pleaded with him. But the older son, the religious older son, the good son, the son that had been faithful for all of these years said, look, all these years I've been been slaving for you. That's not a very good term for a son to say to his father, is it? We catch a glimpse into his attitude. There was no joyful serving within the family ranks. There was a obligation that the older son had of of giving to the family. It was uh, written, and I'm sure checked off on the calendar each and every day that I have done this and this. He probably uh, punched in and had a to-do list in his phone every day and punched it in and said, aha, look what I have done, dad. I'm the good son. That no good rotten son of yours still hasn't returned, but I'm faithful. Here I am. I have been slaving for you, never disobeying your orders. That's that's a pretty good record, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, he didn't even call him his brother, he had already uh, written him off. When this son of yours, who has squandered your property, which was really the son's property because the father gave him his share of the inheritance, and he says he has squandered your property with prostitutes. We have no other place in this story where that has been revealed. The older son either had heard rumors or presumed that that's what was going on. That your son who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. The father says, my son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate and be glad because your brother was dead and is alive, was lost and is found. There's a whole lot of partying going on in this chapter. A whole lot of of, of celebrating, overtly rejoicing when that which was lost is now found. Who do you relate to in this story? Who would you connect with this morning as you think of the father and his two sons. Could you relate to the loving father longingly desiring for that which was lost to be found, that which was rebellious to confess, that which was immersed in squanderous living to to come home and and, and cast himself at at the mercy of the Father's love? 
maybe this morning you relate to the older, responsible brother. Living outwardly faithful. Motivated by justice and fairness. Obligation. Maybe this morning, when we look at ourselves, we began to see that our attitude may not be so much as a a, a loving father longing for all who would repent to come and be a part of the kingdom of God, no matter what they have done in the past, no matter where they are now living, no matter how far they have strayed, no matter what their conditions may have been, no matter how many times they have come back. Maybe, for some of us, we've just... We've given up. We're the older responsible brother who says, somebody has to be. I'm going to take the role of protector. And even though bitterness and frustration and anger is kind of welling up in me, and my service to Christ no longer has any joy, by golly, I'm going to endure to the end, and I'm going to be the faithful one. Maybe you could relate to the younger, irresponsible brother. Adventuresome, restless, heading out into the far country to make your mark and your way, who even maybe through an entire life, you have never come to the place of casting yourself at the mercy of God. Maybe you're still living independently. Maybe you're still living on your own means. Maybe you're still living in your own power. Maybe today you are still in a position of that younger irresponsible brother depending on everybody else to bail you out who've come to a place where you've realized that through all of your adventure and all of your restlessness the pursuit of all of those worldly things has really left you empty and hollow and desirous of something more God is always yearning, desiring, longing for the lost to be found. He's always ready to throw a party of thanksgiving and celebration. I wonder how many opportunities I've missed to truly celebrate with someone who has given their life and heart to Christ, who maybe have come to Jesus, but because there has not been the excitement and the joy and the overwhelming reception into the community of faith that that person has lost their faith and is now wandering and and waiting because the church has lost its ability to party. To celebrate, to live in the joy of one lost individual coming to faith in Jesus. Responsibility is a killer, I know. Pride for trying to always do what's right can stifle the sheer joy of living in Christ. 
simply being motivated by justice and fairness is not a way to garner the joy of, of our salvation. And sometimes even like an older brother, anger and bitterness and frustration and self-centeredness can enter in and we can lose our ability to celebrate and give thanks. Even to the point where our own relationship with God can sometimes be jeopardized. We never know how the older brother ultimately responded. It's left open-ended. We see the party of celebration, the prodigal returning, the father extending his love and forgiveness, the joy and the, and the happiness of, of that one lost individual coming home, and the older brother is outside. The faithful one sulking, waiting, not entering into the festivities, unable to look beyond his own situation was one, was one of provision and, and goodness and, 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 and living with a father of, of, of mercy and grace. And, and he had everything and couldn't see and realize. And he allowed his motivation to be nothing more than duty and obligation. As we share in this old hymn of invitation, I invite you this morning to examine your lives. I, I invited myself as I've been looking and, and reading and preparing and, and, and trying to, to plug in where I am in my journey with God, and I have come to the, to the conclusion that I could use a, a, a lot more joy. And rather than being guarded and being careful and being proper and being appropriate, there's times in the church when it's okay to allow your emotions of joy and thanksgiving and celebration to come out in such a way that we don't have to any longer be financially debt-free to give out a hoot and a holler. There's no greater reason to celebrate than when someone truly has, has been found who was lost, who have returned to their relationship with Christ or stepped through that door for the very first time. We don't hold back. We celebrate, we embrace we feast, we party, we give thanks because that, the scripture says, is why Jesus came. To call sinners unto repentance. To bring people who are lost back into relationship with him. Would you stand with me for this closing hymn? If there is anything on your heart and mind this morning, if you need to just step out and to come to this altar and to say, God, speak fresh into my life. Help me let go. Or maybe for the very first time, realizing that you are a prodigal that has never committed your life to Christ. Maybe realizing you're an older brother with, with stark attitudes then, and you have become so entrenched in your position that grace no longer has a footway or a hold into your life. Or maybe you're a loving father or mother who simply needs to ask God for more, for patience, for stability, for grace, for encouragement, for a loving heart that is being strained and pressed. 
uh, whatever your needs might be this morning, there is a place. Come. Let us stand. A lamb, a coin, a son, a daughter. All who are weary, who are lost, who are in need. Jesus constantly is inviting, come home. Come home. I want to kill the fatted calf and celebrate go knowing you are a child of God. Amen. Amen. Good job.